Right, should I? Yeah, yeah go ahead and start right, this. Yeah. And I'll, so we're going to uh, start off with a video. There's a bit of reading, so I'm going to take a second and I'll play. this information that you're writing down here? Um, high step five, so you're doing Sort of like a health score? Yeah. Oh, very good. And what other information do we write down? Um, the date and the names. Yeah, and then we also get this one here. Yeah, right? the pH. That's pH, yeah. power of hydrogen. Yeah. So we want that number with that power of hydrogen. We'll keep stirring up. We'll put that in there. We need to make sure that all the water is less get one bucket of water in here before we take that test again, okay? There he is. There he is. Okay. Now test it again. So it's like two. Exactly the water that gets dumped into the uh, tower, and then we. Uh, uh, what do you think will happen? We were measuring total dissolved solids earlier. We were measuring the concentration of the food, the nutrients inside the water. When we add a bucket of water that doesn't have nutrients in it, do you think that number that we were listing before? Do you think that'll go up or down? No, probably go down. Yes, pure guess. What about you, Wallace? Have you enjoyed uh, your work with us here so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You like your learning a bit about plant science and how to grow this stuff? What would happen if we left you alone for one day to look after all those towers? Would everything in there die or would everything there be good at the end of your day? Not. Uh, I disagree. Not exactly. I don't know. I feel like you've done pretty well with stuff. Here at all. He knows. Shanjita asks me and herself why she did this. <laughs> it's really bothering her. She, uh, she made a Facebook or a YouTube comment about it. Could you take the video down and don't make me do this? <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, thanks for watching that. My name is Stefan Summer. Um, briefly told, I'll, start, I'll start at the beginning here. Uh, I'm a caretaker for the Toronto District School Board, who some years ago I was asked by um, by the union that represents school board workers. I should mention, I'm from the world of labor. It's cool, nobody's throwing stuff at me. Thank you, good room. Thank you, yeah, so uh, if you're in the wrong room, that's not something you want to announce. But yes, I come from the world of labor. I'm a TDSB caretaker and a member of the Toronto Education Workers Union Local QP 4400. So some years ago, I guess about eight years ago, I was asked to take a couple weeks off from my caretaking job and sort of get the scope of what the Toronto District School Board was doing when it relates to sustainability. Uh, the mandate I was given by our president was literally find out what the board is doing with this eco thing. <laughs> so they named me Eco Boy and they sent me out to go figure out what's going on. And I should mention, I'm like 15 years younger than everyone else in my office. And 
mother worked there, so I'm a kid to everybody. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, so they send me out and they say, uh, just find out what's going on and how we can take part and how this is going to change our jobs. So uh, my first con point of contact was actually one of being Richard Christie, who I'm sure some of you have come across at the um, sustainability office in uh, the TDSB. And Richard was kind enough to sort of help me get uh, an idea of where the focuses uh, were inside the school board and what was happening and how that was going to be changing some of our jobs. So I came back to our panel and I said, uh, all right guys, here's what's going on, here's where I think things are going to change for us, and here's where we might be able to expand a little bit more. And they said, great, uh, would you like to run a project of some sort? And I was like, well, I can't really do that as it is, I'm a caretaker. And they said, well, what if we gave you six months? So they booked me off for six months. This is about seven and a half years ago, so I've done rather well. <laughs> and uh, the evolution of those projects, along the way I did small little composting workshops that were uh, led by a profitable Sunday right here, so Sunday and I have known each other for some years. And uh, the project eventually came around where, due to, uh, Sunday showed you a slide earlier that mentioned something called PPM 150, which was the uh, Ontario government effectively saying no more crappy fried foods in schools. Now, the reason why that would affect the union is that cafeterias are going to shut down in response to not being able to feed uh, the kids the foods that they want to buy. So with the possible job losses in cafeterias, they wanted to approach that by saying, okay, well, Rather than have all these cafeterias closed and all these poor people be thrown out of work, why don't we try and respond to that? So our local matched up with the TDSB and a couple other partners, including George Brown College, Humber College, and some others. Caesar Lee was our uh, like celebrity mascot or whatever you want to call them. And uh, we created something called the uh, Healthy Learning, Healthy Living and the My Food, My Way project. And in response to that, we were trying to repurpose school cafeterias in such a way that kids are going to want to go, we're going to want to eat the healthy menu options, and thus keeping some of those jobs open. So the first step that we had along the way was developing healthy menu options, which is where Susan Lee and some of those other folks came in. But then we wound up, I took a meeting at a Humber College with a couple of young men that had just recently graduated from that. They were the very first graduates of Humber's sustainability program. Their names were Gustavo and Jake. And Gustavo and Jake introduced me to something called Tower Garden. And tower gardening is using vertical aeroponics. Now, aeroponics are very similar to hydroponics. They basically work the same, except uh, if you saw those machines that we were working with, they were growing some food with some lightsabers, you might have noticed. Uh, what it is, is a, a tower garden. It's a 20-gallon reservoir with a column, sort of tower piece, with a whole bunch of plants attached to the outside. Now, they were purpose-built for outdoor use, and that was great for our first year's purposes. In the summertime, I got those kids, Gustavo and Jake, that I mentioned from Humber College. We got them to bring some gear to an interior courtyard at a school in Northwest End called Thistletown Collegiate. Thistletown had a secure inner courtyard where we could, uh, and this is around February we started chattering about it, and around May we started uh, actually growing. And so we had a secure location, so you imagine it's an outdoor location at the very center of a square building, so it was secure from the uh, public and we could sit there and just sort of figure it out for ourselves. The first summer that we operated, we hired a couple of the kids from uh, Thistletown. And I didn't know anything about farming at the time. I was honestly just there to sort of administrate the project a little bit. And I just watched Gustavo and Jake working with the kids, learned what I could. And through the first summer, we grew all kinds of fun stuff there. Uh, one of the things about hydroponics in these tower gardens is you can't grow things like root vegetables. So there are no potatoes, no carrots, no radishes, no beets, and that type of thing. So we're limited mostly to leafy greens and herbs. And uh, when we're doing indoor projects, we do things that are a little bit bigger, like tomatoes and cucumbers and um, also go eggplant, that type of thing. So any fruiting vegetable we generally pulled off until the summertime. And we did that first year program, everything went rather well. And then just as we were uh, wrapping that up, there was an outgoing co-op teacher from Thistletown who was leaving to go to another school called North Humber High School, which is the one featured in the video there. Her name was Helen Montagnese. And Helen, on her way out, grabbed me and said, you know what, I think I've got some money. We've got a $10,000 grant for the school to do something. And she's like, I really think we could do this indoors. So uh, Helen asked me, could you set this up indoors? I said, know much about doing this yet, about actual farming, but I am willing to help you look into this and see what we can do. So we purchased a couple towers, we brought them indoors, the school was very excited to host us, and I should tell you about York Humber High School. It's a school that uh, uh, is mostly for low function kids, so mild intellectual disabilities, development and delay, and physical disabilities as well. So it's a small school, they're fairly well funded, they've got um, a lot of space. We had a, you know, that room that we we're in there is basically a giant classroom, about three times the size of this, that I have all to myself more or less so. I mean, that's sort of an educator's dream, right? <laughs> and 
Helen asked me if I could settle this stuff up. We tried. I first met with, uh, they put, excuse me, um, put me in with uh, a science classroom. And they said, would you like to teach the science of all this? And I was like, great. So I'm literally learning it on Tuesday and teaching it. <laughs> and uh, the first couple times that we, or the first couple towers we brought in there, we noticed that we just did not have enough light to really grow anything substantial. There was a, a little greenhouse room that we could grow in, but anytime anybody who's ever tried to grow food through, uh, uh, windows and TV filters on them, you can't really get much light, especially if you're going to So uh, we retrofitted them with lights. Now the company who sells these actually really liked our idea and started making their own lights. So I'll take a little bit of credit for that, even though they won't give it to me. And uh, the, uh, uh, the project sort of like uh, blossomed and grew from there. Uh, we put the lights on uh, in December right before the kids went away for holidays. When they came back, boom, everything exploded. Everything. When I say everything, not a literal explosion, <laughs> but the vegetables exploded, and the kids' interest exploded, and the school's interest exploded, and they threw the rest of their money into it, and we wound up creating that farm that you see there. So what we've discovered along the way, and I, at that point I was committed to appearing at their school uh, three or four times a week, working with different classes, not always just the one class, but now I spread it to a couple more. Uh, they have in second semester, their semester school, and in the second semester they have something called the Green Industries course, which is fairly new to the TDSB. There's a few schools that have it. And at that point, I partnered up with a teacher named Sam Matheson, who's a culinary arts teacher there. We started sort of plotting. We said, how do we want to approach this? What are we trying to accomplish? And that led to basically everything that you see in that video there. I can tell you briefly that not only has this been the most rewarding portion of you know, my career, my previous career, anything I've ever done professionally, we're getting through to these kids. And we've actually been able to change a lot of the eating habits and the um, the overall impression of what healthy, sustainable food could mean to a child in those situations. And one of the things I'm most proud of is, with all due respect to every gardening program that I've ever taken part in or, or seen, when you have indoor hydroponics with a tower garden who's like the lowest level that you have to work at is really right here. Nobody's getting down on their hands and knees and working. With hy uh, hydroponics, there are no worms, or excuse me, no snails in your garden. There are no <laughs> weeds to take care of. And that's, you know, as anybody who's managed a garden, it's a lot of the time you spend is weeding, right? We don't have to worry about all that. And because it's at that sort of like mighty level, we are actually able to bring uh, students in wheelchairs to come work inside the gardens. It was the very first gardening experience that many of them had ever gotten. And it allowed them, we sort of try to direct it in this regard, but uh, I've had three students that were wheelchair bound who I would say are probably the leaders of their little gardening clubs because they can do that. It's a leadership role that they can take for the very first time in their lives because things just don't necessarily shake out that way working that out with the classroom. So, very, very happy to see them uh, thriving in that environment. But what we were able to do was take the gardening experience and move it indoors. And that's something that uh, allows us to sort of address the issue of how do you really teach functional gardening when the kids are all at home in the summertime, which is the only time you really can teach it outdoors. So, we found that hydroponics can address a lot of those questions. So, the success of our program has been uh, mostly predicated on the fact that students are hyper engaged in this. It is a reward for them to take part in the program. And students with behavioral issues, this is uh, another area that I like to focus on personally, is working with young men who have very, very difficult, it's mostly young men, I'd like to say that it's a, a fair split, but it's really not. Most of the students I work with are young boys who have a very difficult time focusing in class. So a lot of them, if I'm just being honest, are coming to class stoned, or they're coming to class after uh, you know taking off the morning or something like that, and they're not engaged in any kind of learning, but because I'm kind of a hyper guy and I'm in a lot of the same things they are, you know, we name the towers after comic book characters, the pop artists, and that type of stuff. Like it's, we try and reach them on uh, on their level of existence and find ways to communicate that makes sense to them. Uh, we've written you know like little uh, rap ciphers and stuff like that to try and uh, increase the level of education they're getting and sort of their uh, hydroponic vocabulary, gardening vocabulary, if you will. So. You know, we, we sneak that little edu education in with them. So, uh, the if I was, I always try and express to people that it's possible to do this in any classroom and in any school, and it's fairly low cost. Uh, the equipment itself is uh, those tower gardens for the ones with lights and run just under a thousand dollars, and the quality of the produce is greater than anything I've ever been able to pull out of the ground myself. Mm -hmm. um, that's because I'm not really the greatest gardener in the world, but high quality produce. And you're Right, the kids with kale, you wouldn't believe how much they eat <laughs> kale. And it makes no sense to me because when I first ate kale, I was like, this is disgusting. I believe this. And now I'm addicted to it as well. But the connection, uh, as you know, the other panelists were mentioning, the connection uh, between the kids and the food really gets established once they've grown it themselves. 
And those first, I always sort of like in my head, I call them like, oh wow moments. I do uh, germinations, uh, we do our seedling germination on Thursdays in this uh, little growing medium called Rockville. So just imagine we're taking seeds, putting them in these little green plugs, and I do that on Thursdays with the kids, so that when I come back to see them on Monday, they've come up, they spread it. And the first time where, you know, I set them all up and then I go and I grab it, and it's like, here's what we've done, guys. Bam. The last time they saw it, it was just a flat piece of what looks like cake, and the next time they saw it, things are growing, and their eyes go, cool, and they want to touch it, and then they want to see it, and it's like, oh my god, look at that, you know? Then, you know, a week later, we transfer all that into the towers, and the kids wind up with uh, sort of a, a true field-to-table experience, because everything that we have grown on any school I've ever been in gets used in that cafeteria, and I'm happy to report that every school that I work in still has a functioning cafeteria that has either face closure at some point and defeated it, or is uh, hopefully going to be defeating it in the future. So we've found our success doing that, and I urge everybody who's in this room, like, please give it a shot. If you think that you have an opportunity to run something like this at your school, come talk to me, and I'll help you figure out how to make it happen. So. Yes? So our school that I work in is just outside of London, okay. and we're part of, um, we applied, uh, our county, Middlesex County, applied for a grant um, called the Kids Community Challenge. Mm -hmm. And theme three is choose to boost veggies and fruit, and the winning schools all earned a garden tower. So there's 11 schools. I sit on the committee for that, and our school as well. So we're all a little bit nervous, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, but once you put the garden, to, the tower together, there's been, it's the buzz of the school. And we put ours in our library, just because it's the most accessible place. So we just did our seeds in the rock walls, and I, I am a kindergarten educator, so the kids are like, and they've never seen a seed. It was amazing, they're like, what is that? And I said, that's the seed, this is how things start. So you're the first person I've actually met who's actually done this, so on half of our 11 schools, once we've transplanted, like put these rock walls in the tower, how long, like, does it, produce like what you showed in your video and once you kind of pick that, does it reblow or are we doing the rock walls? Totally depends <laughs> in on your experience. Totally depends on what you're growing. Uh, kale, if you're ever gonna start with something like this, I highly recommend you start with kale because kale can regrow. Um, okay. like it's what they call like a cut and come again. You just snip it off and then it'll just keep growing until eventually the plant itself gets too big to really rest on that tower and at that point you switch it out. Uh, if you're doing lettuces, generally I recommend harvesting a lettuce plant once, twice at the most, but the third time it's extremely bitter and not terribly tasty. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, basil on a long enough timeline, um, I've never seen basil in a hydroponic tower uh, survive. It's called botrytis. It's uh, a bulb that tends to grow in uh, hydroponic foods. Oh. And uh, it's sort of tough to manage once it appears in the tower. You just swap the water out and oh. take away the, the disease plant. But basil will grow quite a bit, and then eventually it always tends to catch it. So mm -hmm. I don't know any hydroponic growers who really think it would go uh, and then, so definitely start with kale. Uh, Swiss chard is another really great one to, to grow in there, rainbow Swiss chard. And uh, the neat thing that you can't see in any of these videos is that when something like uh, rainbow Swiss chard, if anybody's ever worked with it, it's very, very brightly colored pigs, yellows and yeah, it's green. Uh, yeah, if you uh, wait until it grows and gets you know fully matured, harvest everything, and then when you're taking the tower apart, if the kids look at the roots inside. It's an interesting experience you get with these tower gardens with anything hydroponic is that you can see the roots of the plants that you don't normally see underground. And they're very brightly colored. They're really crazy. They look like human hair. And the kids touch them and then freak out. And touch them and then, you know, so there's a lot of those, and that's another one of those oh wow moments. And uh, eating it. Uh, that's the last thing I want to touch on is uh, I actually uh, I highly encourage the kids to, um, to just pluck off the tower as often as they want. And uh, I never really have to encourage them anymore. That's sort of the first thing they do, like, I gather up a group from the third floor, we go down to the lab on the main floor, and the first thing you do when they go in there is like, oh, is there any more of that Chevelle? Oh, I love that stuff. <laughs> oh, oh, what about dill? Yeah, it's like dill pickle chips. Hey, my, you know, they, just, they, they get so hyped and so excited, and we sort of treat it as a reward for classwork done. And the last thing I'll mention is that a bunch of those students that you've seen, I actually hire them in the summertime. That's what we do, is uh, I'm allowed to operate inside the schools in the summer, so I take two kids, two, sometimes three, from a uh, project that we from the academic program, and then we give them basically it's almost always the first real job. So fun little thing.